This session introduces the main concepts of version control. Sufficient information is provided to support the Subversion Guru training. Version control aims to provide secure storage for items, maintain a history of changes to these items, including any additional information such as who made each item, when it was made, what type of item it is. To introduce the basic idea of reverse and control, we will examine the history of a single file. The file is created, typically by a developer using whatever file editing software they prefer. The editor may have edited and saved the file many times as they created the file, but these local copies are not considered versions of the file. The item is then logged with the version control system. This we call the first version, or version 1 of the file. So far as the version control system is concerned, only files logged within the system are considered versions, never the locally edited files. The term revision may also be used as well as version. This can be a little confusing. Some tools are called revision control systems, RCS for short. Others, version control systems, VCS for short. Since revision is the term used by subversion, I'll use revision from now on, but remember version and revision are used interchangeably. Files seldom remain unchanged in development projects. After all, if files never changed, there would hardly be any development happening. When a change to the file is required, a copy of the file is made from the version control system. Taking a copy ensures that the work starts with a clean copy of a revision of the file and, more importantly, taking a copy preserves the revision in the version control system. We never change the revisions held in the version control system. We make any changes necessary to the copy we have outside the version control system. Once the changes are complete, the new file is put into the version control system. This new revision is identified as revision 2, the second revision in the version control system. The differences between revision 1 and revision 2 can be expressed as a set of instructions, add, remove or modify. These are the only three operations necessary and even modify could be expressed as add and delete. Think about the instruction modify line 1 to read Mary has a little lamb. This single instruction could be written, remove line 1, Mary had, uh, Mary had a little lamb, and then add line 1, Mary had a little lamb. Same result. This set of instructions describing the difference between two revisions is called a delta. We can take revision 1 and apply steps described in the delta to get revision 2, or we can take revision 2 and apply the steps in the delta in reverse, replacing all adds with removes, all removes with adds, and reversing all modifications, uh, to derive revision 1. We can visualize this history of revisions with intervening deltas as a graph of nodes, each node representing a revision of the file, and each connector between nodes representing a delta that describes how to transform the revision at one end of the connector into the revision found at the other end of the connector. To make another copy, we take a copy of revision 2 from the version control system, make the change on our local copy, and once the change is complete, we place it back into the reversion control system as revision 3. In this way, we see that the history of changes is built up revision by revision. Each revision is held in the version control system and can be recalled at any time. Software systems are made of more than one file, though, and these ideas of revision control can be extended to more than a single file. When more files are involved, the basic idea of revisions connected by deltas remains the same. Only the scope of the revisions and the deltas change. Suppose instead of just one file, our system consists of three files, two in the root directory and one in the subdirectory. For simplicity, we will label these file 1, file 2 and file 3 respectively. 
Revision 1 of our system therefore looks like this. We identify that a change is required to file 1. So we take a copy of Revision 1 of file 1, make our changes to the copy, then replace that revision into the version control tool as Revision 2 of file 1. Notice that we could also say that we have created Revision 2 of the whole system. Looking at the system as a single item, Revision 1 consists of all the original files and Revision 2 is all the original files with file 1 replaced by its updated revision. The delta is essentially the same whichever view we take. Suppose we added a line to file 1. The delta between file 1 revision 1 and file 1 revision 2 simply says add one line. Looking at this change from the system level, we need only add the phrase to file 1. Now the delta applies to the system as a whole and describes how to transform version 1 of the system into version 2 of the system. In a real life situation, a developer would usually take a copy of the entire system from the version control system rather than just the files they wish to change. This is usually necessary so that the developer can build the system for testing. Suppose the next change required modifications to both file 1 and file 2. We take a copy of all the files from the version control system, revision 2 of file 1, revision 1 of file 2 and 3, make the modifications required and then replace the modified files in, uh, as revision 3 of file 1 and revision 2 of file 2. Since file 3 is unchanged, we don't create a new revision of file 3 in the version control system. All of this activity can also be viewed collectively as revision 3 of the whole system. We can see that we can look at the deltas for individual files or we can add all the deltas together and view this as a delta to transform revision 2 of the system into revision 3. Some version control systems, including subversion, also treat directories as items with a revision history. Our next change requires the addition of a new file, file 4, into the subdirectory. We can take a copy of all the files and the directory from the version control system and add the new file into our copy. We then create a new revision in the reversion version control system, revision 1 of file 4 is added to the new revision, revision 2 of the directory is created. Comparing versions 3 and 4 of the whole system, it's easy to see the change to the directory. Subversion can appear a little idiosyncratic when it comes to revision numbers. This is because the only thing that is assigned a revision number is the entire repository. Looking back at the example used when introducing general concepts behind version control, we can see four revisions of the repository. In each revision, some file or directory change were recorded. Each time a file or directory is changed, we recorded this by making a new revision and each revision was identified by a sequential revision number associated with that file or folder. We can change this to look like a revision history in subversion by changing each revision number to the repository revision in which that file or folder was changed. Notice that the revision numbers associated with each file and directory are no longer necessarily contiguous. Instead, these revision numbers should be read as this item changed in the nth revision of the repository. In between these changes, a file or directory will maintain the revision number assigned the last time it changed. So file 2 in revision 2 of the repository still shows as revision 1 because the last time that this file was changed the repository was at revision 1. File 3, on the other hand, shows revisions 1, 2 and 3 because it was updated in each corresponding update of the repository. File 3 was not updated in revision 4 of the repository, so it is shown in revision 4 of the repository as revision 3 of the file. File 4 was added in revision 4 of the repository, so its first revision is actually identified as revision 4. Looking at the individual histories for each of these files, we see that the histories appear to be fragmented. There seem to be missing revisions. This is sometimes confusing to new users. It is important to understand that the revision numbers in an item's history do not enumerate the revisions of the item. 
That is, they do not run revision 1, 2, 3 and so on for the item itself. The revisions shown in an item's history are the revision of the repository in which that item was created. You will see many, many examples of subversion revisions as we work through this course. So if you don't understand this completely now, don't worry. There are plenty of opportunities to study subversions revisions in the rest of the course. When working in teams, there is a need to coordinate the effort of individuals to avoid wasted effort. This does not necessarily mean preventing individuals from working independently, but it may mean adding some process to the team's operations. The simplest situation that requires coordination involves just two people, John and Jill. Suppose our system consists of just two files, files one and two. When John and Jill make each independent change, when John and Jill each make independent changes to different files in the system, there is no need for them to coordinate their effort. John needs to make a change to file 1, Jill needs to make a change to file 2. Each can take a copy of the file and they need to change, make the changes in their own private working copies and replace the new revisions into the shared repository. Since these changes are independent, it doesn't matter whether John or Jill completes their work first. The repository simply tracks the revisions of each file. What sort of issues can we anticipate as John and Jill work on changes that are not so independent? John and Jill are both tasked with making a change to the system. John begins by making a change to file 1. Jill begins by making a change to file 2. John now realises that he needs to change file 2 and at the same moment Jill realises that she needs to change file 1. John and Jill now face a common problem encountered during any development effort. John could continue to modify file 2 regardless of Jill's activity. Similarly, Jill may continue to modify file 1 regardless of John's efforts. John and Jill may well be unaware of each other's activity. Suppose John completes his changes and returns them to the shared repository. What should Jill now do? John has preempted her changes to the files. If Jill simply replaces her changes into the shared repository, then John changes will not be present in the latest revisions of file 1 and file 2. Jill has overwritten John's changes. John's changes are still present in the repository in the previous revisions, but any developer looking to make a change to file 1 or file 2 will look for the latest revisions to start working from, assuming that they will contain all the latest changes of the files. What they will actually find is Jill's copies, which exclude John's work entirely. What the developer is probably expecting is a version that includes both John's and Jill's changes. Certainly, John would expect the latest version of file 1 and file 2 to include his changes. Obviously, John and Jill need some mechanism that ensures that either this situation cannot happen or, once it does happen, ensure that it can be resolved without losing information. Version control tools tend to use one of two approaches to coordinating the work of developers. Lock, modify, unlock or copy, modify, merge. John and Jill are setting out to make their changes once again. John locks file 1 in preparation for making his changes and Jill locks file 2 in preparation for her changes. Each lock is recorded in the shared repository and prevents any other developer from locking the file and consequently prevents any developer not holding the lock from modifying the locked file. John now discovers that he needs to modify file 2 in order to complete his change. John attempts to lock file 2 in order to make changes, but file 2 is already locked by Jill, so John is prevented from making changes to it until Jill completes her changes. Meanwhile, Jill discovers that she needs to change file 1 in order to complete her changes, and she attempts to lock file 1 in order to make the changes, but is blocked because John already holds a lock on file 1. John and Jill must now decide how to resolve this deadlock. Since neither can complete their change until the other unlocks their file, one of them must give way to allow the other to continue. If John gives way, 
he effectively abandons his changes to file 1, releases the lock to allow Jill to claim the lock on file 1, Jill performs her changes and replaces files 1 and 2 in the shared repository. John can now claim the locks on both file 1 and 2, make fresh copies of file 1 and 2 from the shared repository, make any changes he needs to, and update the shared repository. This is the lock modify unlock approach to version control. Lock modify unlock is also sometimes called pessimistic locking because users start with all files set to read only and they must claim a lock in the shared repository before being allowed to make changes to their local working copies. This approach serializes changes, helping to prevent the overwriting of changes at the cost of potentially extending development times. Alternatively, John and Jill could have proceeded like this. John takes a copy of the system and proceeds to modify file 1. Jill also takes a copy of the system and changes file 2. Once again, they both find a need to modify the other file in the system. This time, each simply proceeds to make the changes to both files, just as they did in the original example. The difference comes with how they resolve replacing files into the shared repository. John completes his change first and replaces both files in the shared repository. Jill now completes her changes and attempts to replace them in the shared repository, but the repository prevents her from doing so because John has created updated revisions of the files that Jill started from. In order for Jill to proceed, she must incorporate John's changes from the shared repository. Once Jill has incorporated John's changes, the shared repository allows her to return her changes as the next revision of each file. This approach is copy, modify, merge. Copy, modify, merge is also sometimes called optimistic locking because users start with all files available to be edited. It allows individuals to get on with their own changes at a potential cost of adding work at the end of each change in order to combine them. Optimistic locking works on the principle that most conflicting changes, where two users update the same files, are easy to merge. This proves to be the case for most development environments. We shall see situations in which this optimism is thwarted and how Subversion helps to manage these situations as we go through the remainder of the course. Subversion is based on this copy-modify-merge approach but it does provide the capacity to implement the lock-modify-unlock model should you need it.